All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. I am Chris Short, uh, Principal Technical Marketing Manager at Red Hat. <laughs> I'm also a Cloud Native Computing Foundation Ambassador. I'll be moderating cool. today's webinar, uh, QVert Beyond Containers, Coming Full Circle Back to VMs. Uh, before I introduce today's guests, uh, I'll go over a few housekeeping items. Um, during the webinar, you're not able to talk as an attendee, um, but there is a Q&A box that pretty much everyone on the call will be monitoring. Um, feel free to type your questions in, and if I can't answer them kind of on the fly, I will make sure they're fielded up and wrecked and stacked accordingly. Uh, <clears throat> drop your questions in there, and we will get to them. Thank you. The, uh, the next thing is if you have, um, you know, questions or want to just share information in the chat, feel free. And uh, without further ado, let me introduce uh, Rupak Parikh, uh, co-founder and CTO, and Joshua Hurt, senior software engineer at Platform9. Uh, please take it away. Thanks, Chris. I'm uh, pretty excited to talk about QVert as we go not only with, uh, with Kubernetes with containers, but beyond that with virtual machines. So I have Josh Hurt with me here. Hello. In fact, from Nine, he's uh, one of the engineers at our Kubernetes team. So today we will talk about QVert. I will do, just do an introduction, talk about a few use cases. Josh will then talk about how do you really use it how do you create virtual machines with it? Then I will talk about architecture and followed by a demo and QA. So what is QBert? Well, QBert is a operator. It's a set of CRDs to create virtual machines along with containers. It, ha it uses the same orchestration engine as Kubernetes to do scheduling, use the same storage, uh, same networking, so if you have CNIs, it can reuse that. If you have monitoring with Prometheus, you should be able to use that or anything else that you're using with Kubernetes. And obviously all the tooling, including your favorite kubectl. It started in uh, 2016 with Red Hat. Um, kudos to them. A fantastic project, open source in 2017. Um, it's trying to be part of the CNCF sandbox. Uh, it is 1400 plus stars. You can join virtualization channel on Slack uh, to see what's going on. There is weekly meeting there. And, there are, and these are the few companies who have uh, contributed, uh, contributed to Kubernetes, uh, KubeWord along with, along with Red Hat. <clears throat> so I was looking at a PR recently where KubeWord was trying to make a case uh, to become a CNCF sandbox um, project. And I stumbled upon lot of comments from the users who are really using it. So SAP, NVIDIA, and then Cloudflare are the three examples that I have posted on the slide. They are using it for different use cases, but all of them either want to be running virtual machines because they have uh, legacy workloads or workloads that cannot move out of virtual machines, or they are using it in very interesting ways to run Kubernetes on Kubernetes. And I will talk about that in a, in, a, in a moment. So let's go through some of the use cases that I have seen. I'm pretty sure that there are many, many more. But really, you have Kubernetes as one orchestration platform to manage both virtual machines and <clears throat> containers, which means you can use your CI CD pipeline, your processes, your RBAC, um, DAX or whatever you have done to integrate your Kubernetes with, uh, with other systems in-house, including a monitoring uh, logging systems. So can I just mention something sure, about go ahead. that? Um, so uh, elaborating a bit more on the one orchestration platform, I think that uh, this is perhaps one of the more underrated like, benefits of using KubeVert to manage your VMs. Um, you do have solutions such as Kubernetes native API gateways, which allow VMs to talk to containerized workloads, but this means that your VMs are still running outside of Kubernetes. Uh, so although the connectivity is there, the management of the VMs themselves is still outside of Kubernetes requiring some other orchestration tool uh, to do that. And that's just 
more difficult, right, operation-wise. Yep. Uh, so so you want to mention that? Yep. Thanks, Josh. So that means you have two systems to maintain and two different APIs and two different sets of integration. Yep. So the next one in line is pretty obvious. Um, you have applications which are moving from being monolithic, uh, perhaps running in virtual machines, and you are trying to create microservices out of some of them, and the, you want to interoperate. You want to run them under one orchestration platform. Maybe there are virtual machines uh, which are, are running network function virtualization for telecom industries and for a uh, lot of uh, IO intensive workloads. You may be using custom kernel modules, using things like SRIOV, which gives you performance benefits, or using um, custom kernel module as well. Uh, you, may, you may be running virtual machines uh, where you where it will stay in virtual machines for a really long time uh, before they move to containers. So you will be, you can use network functions for that particular kind of workloads. And in the application stack, if you have services that you're trying to, again, turn into microservices that can run into containers, they can, they can run in the container side by side. Especially with the NFV stack, uh, with a lot of careers use, there is a strong desire to move to microservices, but there are technical limitations on how containers uh, may not be used for, uh, for the network functions itself. So the virtual machines are still relevant there. Next one is a really interesting use case that I did not really think about, but when I was browsing <clears throat> through uh, the list that I spoke about, I, I stumbled upon that. And Josh here as well did exactly the same thing. We call it the turtles all the way down. Um, what, he, what people are doing is they take a set of physical servers, run a keyboard on it, create virtual machines, and those virtual machines are given to the users uh, in a self-service way so that they can create more user level or workload Kubernetes clusters on those virtual machines. So it's a self-service uh, Kubernetes cluster creation on top of Kubernetes uh, running virtual machines. The, the cluster API has a Kubert cloud provider that, that you can easily use to do that. And um, it's, it's becoming very popular. Josh, do you have a word to add on that? Um, yeah, so just uh, there's, there's a lot of hype uh, around bare metal Kubernetes. And I think that that maybe makes sense for, say, a production cluster when you need the absolute most performance out of mm -hmm. you know, your machines, right, your workloads, or for your workloads. But the flexibility of having this type of setup uh, with Kubevert to take full advantage of your bare metal machines is really just excellent. Uh, I've long thought that having some sort of IaaS or virtualization software on top of your on-prem servers for which you can run Kubernetes on top of is the most efficient use of your, your yep. on-prem hardware. So, this just really works super well together. It is immediately what me as a de developer gravitated towards using, uh, and it, it just works great. Yep. Which brings to the last point in the use cases. Um, we have predominantly seen a uh, cube word being used in uh, dev test clouds. So you have virtual machines which are immutable. So if you have builders uh, which are still based upon virtual machines, but you'd like to start them, but then throw them away, you want to give self-service, like the way we just uh, spoke about how you can do Kubernetes on Kubernetes. You can give it to your developers to run virtual machines and just increasing the velocity and the productivity inside your CI CD pipeline or the self-service use case. So with that, let me hand it over to Josh. Um, Josh will talk about what are the different ways in which you can create virtual machines and what are the few other things that are available in Kubernetes. Yeah, thanks, Rupak. Okay, so we got a little bit of overlap here um, in these concepts. If we can maybe delete some of these. Oh, yeah, it's okay. Or just restart it. Yeah, let's go ahead, Josh. 
Okay, there we go. Excellent. Thanks. You know, just restart it. <laughs> Microservices. So, <clears throat> yeah, I just want to run through some of the concepts. Uh, so the, the very first thing that most people will want to create is the virtual machine. So the virtual machine itself is, um, is nothing. It is, it is just a object, right? And contained in that object, uh, the spec is the, the virtual machine instance spec is actually embedded in the, v, the virtual machine CRD itself, right? Uh, and this allows sort of one level of abstraction above your actual running virtual machine so that you can give it directives such as running or not or additional labels and so on and so forth, right? Uh, including things like, well, data volume integration, but that's not right here. So yeah, and then the actual VM that is running is the virtual machine instance. Uh, from here on out, I'm really just going to refer to it as VMI because it's a big mouthful. Yeah. Um, and so these are the two building blocks. Um, you have some things like virtual machine instance replica set because it is a CRD. And so you get a lot of Kubernetes native ways of defining these resources and handling them as well. Um, and so uh, one, one thing that I really like about Kubevert is this other resource they have called a VMI preset. And this is uh, most commonly referred to as a flavor in a lot of other VM-based virtualization platforms, right? EC2, OpenStack, so on and so forth. The nice thing about the way that a VMI preset works here that addresses possible issues with other flavors um, and in other platforms is it kind of has this fallback mechanism. So because um, Qvert is CRD based, then you get to use things in a Kubernetes native way, and that means you're using labels. So you specify, when you create a VMI preset, you specify a label. Um, and as long as your VMI has a label which matches that, the VMI will automatically use all of the uh, uh, specifications in your VMI preset, which is you can set everything in there uh, as you could set in a VMI itself. Um, but then the cool part about that is your VMI could override anything uh, and it'll always just default to the VMI preset if it's not overridden. And that's like a really powerful thing because you're not, it's not as rigid, right, as a true flavor. Josh, the, what can you do with preset? Can you set memory? CPU, yep. is that it? You can do that's what we do at Flavor, but at in AWS with, with Flavor sizes, can you do more? Right, you can do more. So you can actually set networking as well. Okay. Um, which is pretty nice, because then you start to get into this territory uh, that is maybe neutron-ish in, in some ways, right? So, <clears throat> yeah, moving on, you have these uh, two primary VM booting options. Um, that's whether basically it comes down to whether or not you want changes to persist uh, after your VM is gone, right? So for a lot of ephemeral workloads or just spinning up to accomplish some task and then spinning down, you don't really need persistence. So they have this ephemeral disk. Um, Kubevert has made it really easy to have just images listed because they have a way to integrate, uh, basically keep the list of images in Docker, which is really nice. It's simply just writing it to slash data. And slash, then it's slash disk. Or slash, sorry, slash disk. Yeah. So, uh, and then you have persistent disks. And um, basically, it's a persistent volume claim with the image, right? And so, uh, I just wanted to mention, because this solves uh, the hard problem of how do I load in compatible images for VMs. Under the Kubert organization, there's a second repo called CDI, Containerized Data Importer. And it just makes the uploading and cloning of images, you know, a little bit simpler. It's a CRD, which sits basically on top of PVCs, and it's the data volume, right? Uh, there's this nice diagram here that explains pretty much the most common use case, which is having the golden image and 
your VMs can sort of reference that, right? <clears throat> and then um, storage, um, you get cloud init, you know, c config drive, no cloud. You can actually set a cloud init and ha have all of your cloud init be in a secret in Kubernetes, which is nice if you have cloud init that contains sensitive information. Uh, empty disks for just, you know, additional extra storage. It's, it, it all just simply gets mounted as a device at the end of the day. Uh, host disks is nice, especially if you just have an image on the node itself that you don't want, you know, anywhere else. Um, and then data volumes kind of sit on top of, of a lot of these available options. And you also get these uh, Kubernetes primitives, such as config map, secrets, and service accounts that really are just mounted as disks inside the VM. Uh, so it's very straightforward. There is a, a limitation today um, where any updates to the config map, secret, or service account will not actually be reflected in the VM. Um, so you would need to re re restart the VM in order for that to take effect. Well, really recreate the VMI object. Um, but otherwise, nothing special. And also, there's nice stuff. If you, if you do choose the correct PVC types, uh, access modes and then have the, you know, if you configure storage and networking just right, you get live migration. So, so um, going back, just wanted to mention for people who are not aware of cloud in it, if you have used uh, <coughs> user data in AWS where you can inject startup scripts or just plain data into the virtual machine, uh, cloud in it will let you do it. And Josh was referring how interoperable it is with the Kubernetes ecosystems of secrets and then config maps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go for it. Yeah, and uh, so out of the box, the the networking is it's it's nice. It's just native pod networking. Um, so that means that by default, the bridge option is chosen. So your VM will actually have the pod IP of the vert launcher pod, which you know, represents the actual VM. Um, and this integrates with things out of the box, like you know, Istio, for example, having sidecar containers and, and whatnot. This is, this is nice. I mean, there's other options as well. You can have you know, pod masquerading so that there's a, a defined CIDR that you can choose yourself for which VMs are an assigned a private IP, and but they're natted with the pod IP, if you so choose to do that. And then there's more advanced networking use cases, which start to get into more traditional uh, VM networking setups. And, and some of these extra CNIs, like Multis especially, provide you know the ability to run have like SRIOV um, networking. And so you have your VMs talk directly down to the NIC and multiple interfaces for yep. your pods, which may be really important for virtual machines acting as, uh, <clears throat> let's say, network functions, acting as virtual routers uh, in your setup. And this is really nice that Kubevert, um, even though it is a you know still early-ish project, has decided to really focus on this extreme, like hardcore use case because VM right uses now are advanced and unless you have advanced features, you know, advanced integrations, it's really hard to say, yes, we should use Kubert for VMs because you'd be losing out on, on performance, right? And so I'm gonna give it back to Rupak. He's gonna go over the architecture of Kubert. Thanks, Josh. So Josh <clears throat> explained all the different concepts, how you can create a custom resource of virtual machines, so when you create a custom resource of virtual machine, you, you can create a virtual machine, and then you can start a virtual machine, you can stop a virtual machine. Uh, then he also spoke about the storage and how the virtual machine disk comes <coughs> into existence with the images option, persistent and non-persistent. So let me go into behind the scenes, under the hood, how exactly it, it works. So let's start with how will you actually virtualize or you will run a virtual machine inside Kubernetes. 
So the, the, the very natural place is a pod. And this is where you will run the virtual machine. So when, when you see a virtual machine instance creation, what you will see is a corresponding pod startup. And that pod name is world launcher dash something. And if you look at it internal, there are multiple containers. Depending upon how you're starting, there can be one or many. If you are using container images, there are actually two of them. The first one is called the volume container, which uh, looks at the Docker image and the embedded virtual machine image inside the Docker image. It takes it, extracts it, and give it to another container, which is the compute container that will actually run the virtual machine. That compute container it launches Word Launcher, which is responsible for interacting with LibWord. For those of who, who you do, do not know about LibWord, LibWord is the standard library uh, used to spawn virtual machines on Linux. <coughs> it uses LibWord extensively to, uh, to launch and provide the features that the user has asked for, uh, which includes your memory limits, your CPU limits, uh, your devices that are connected to virtual machine. Now that LibWord, also uh, can be controlled, and we will see this in, in the later slides, by other components in the system to start the virtual machine, to stop the virtual machine. Unlike containers which start by default, virtual machine can be dormant and can be started later on. So LibWord provides that capability. Um, it also has even more capabilities that are not in Qubit yet but they're slowly making their way into it. For example, if you want to hot plug or unplug devices or even memory or, or disk, uh, disk you can, but uh, other things uh, you may not be able to do, but those can be uh, or will be added in, in, in future. So the word launcher launches Q, uh, LibWord as a child process. The LibWord internally runs virtual machine using either just plain QMU or uh, uses KVM. Now, the, if you look at the diagram here, I'm showing a kind of a storage on the host. This is where the, the disk of the containers, or oh, sorry, of the virtual machines live. Either that, or they will live on a PVC like Josh explained earlier. <clears throat> now, I'm just talking about two containers in that part. There can be many more, depends upon what features you're using. So you can have sidecars for liveness checks, or you can have sidecars for Istio, like Josh mentioned earlier. The other thing to note is, um, since it uses uh, Linux, QMU, and KVM, uh, by default, you need to run it on bare metal server, so you can run virtual machine natively, but you can also run it in uh, virtual machine with binary translation, sorry, an under virtual machine in a nested virtualization mode by using binary translation. It's a little slower, but good enough for a POC or a demo or, or for your test purposes. And I will be showing later on how am I, actually I'm running this whole setup inside a virtual machine on AWS using just QMU. There are some configuration options that you need to set uh, to uh, use the emulation mode, but once you do it, uh, you'd be able to run the virtual machine. So let's go to the next slide. So now you have the virtual machine running inside a container. Um, how do you connect it to the outer world? How do you do networking? Well, on the bottom of the screen, you have the CNI. When, you, when a container on the pod is created, rather a pod is created, I'm just showing the compute container here. Uh, when a pod is created, we get a VEAT pair um, from the CNI into the container, which appears as E0. So if you log into the container, you do IPA, you will see E0. The word launcher creates a bridge, creates a tab device, and takes the IP address that was assigned to the container and then assigns it to the virtual machine that's running inside the container. Which means this pod, if you log in exec into this container, 
you won't be able to go out of that container. This part does not have networking. By the way, this is just the default option. There are many different options available, so it's possible to do netting or masquerading. Uh, Josh spoke about that briefly. But this is the primary way by which the IP address of the pod is actually given to the virtual machine. And then the virtual machine, which is the workload, communicates with other containers in the system as if it's another container or another pod in the system. The communication to the actual container and the pod now happens through, let me go back, to the shared directories or the Unix sockets that are exposed uh, through the file system. That means, you know, thinking about this now, um, one, one possible use case or, or benefit of this uh, could be something like, um, I've seen this project like Overcube, basically if you have bare metal running kubevert and then you create a bunch of VMs on that Kubernetes cluster and yep. the VMs are actually comprised of uh, another cluster themselves, yep. you get to use the, the under cube, right, the underlying Kubernetes uh, constructs for things like load balancing and whatnot, you could potentially install Metal LB and use these to, to provide your VIP for, for that like high yeah. availability. Uh, yeah, good, good point. Because it is a virtual IP when you it, think it, about it. It uh, is exactly Especially that. in the masquerade mode. Yep, that's what it is. Um, so, okay, so l l let's go from, so now we have created the virtual machine and setting inside the container mm -hmm and the networking established. Let's see how we actually create the, the, the virtual machines. Now, if you look uh, in, in the source code and if you're interested, there are many controllers in, in the system. So I'm listed, I have listed a few here. These are the major ones. Virtual machine corresponds to the virtual machine. CRD, virtual machine instance, corresponds to virtual machine instance. Uh, CRD, and uh, we spoke about replica set where you want to just like replica sets in containers, you can create virtual machine replica set. So what you will see is there is a controller for each, and some of these are actually very, very simple, but some of them are very complicated. So for example, when you create a virtual machine, the call go comes to the kubectl or your API server to etcd. The controller actually does not much the object that sits there, but when a user says, okay, you know what, I want to start that virtual machine, which means you're changing the property of that virtual machine as soon as you say start, the virtual machine instance controller kicks in, and then it goes and starts the virtual machine. I will talk about that in a second. Um, so, we have, so the project is still evolving. There are a lot, many more objects that are, uh, that are going to be coming up. VM groups is is something um, uh, so something to note. It's it's work in progress right now. Uh, I just like to mention Go something ahead. too. So uh, due to the fact that the project was started, you know, in 2016 and open source in 2017, for anyone who's interested in going and looking at the source code, um, who may be familiar with some of the the newer directory layouts or structures of developing CRDs and controllers such as Cube Builder or the Operator SDK. Um, this repo is going to look a little bit different. Uh, however, just because those tools weren't available at the time. However, I think that the Kubevert team did a good job of organizing things and using those those you know primitives in to develop this. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Josh. <clears throat> and the last one in the picture is a daemon set called as Word Handler. So unlike the controller that we just spoke about, which, which are singletons mostly, um, the word handler is, is a daemon set works on every node. And what it does is it communicates with the word launcher, uh, with the Unix domain sockets, or the next domain sockets uh, that I spoke about earlier to do future operations on virtual machines, which means you can stop it update it, restart it, I check the status, how it's doing. And, and 
even in future uh, hot plug it unplug it that can be done through word handler so these three uh, is is the core system behind behind qword so let me put this all together so this is the complete picture obviously much simplified so you have api servers controllers are acting on the objects then communicating with the word handler to launch the pod which are controlled primarily by word launcher uh, libword as the underlying subsystem which creates virtual machines and you have other pods living in the system which are obviously controlled by kubelet along with the scheduler and the api server one thing to note because this is just a pod the scheduler is uh, the same there is no changes there are no changes to the scheduler it just looks at the resource constraints and schedules uh, and schedules it accordingly so if you want to schedule um, with specific policies where you want to have an affinity or affinity between virtual machines for performance or isolation reasons you you can do all of that so with that uh, let me stop and go for a demo <clears throat> so i hope yeah, okay. let me increase the font size a little bit more so here i'm going to be I will create a, actually I've already created a Windows virtual machine. So this is an example of a virtual machine instance object. Um, it is a Win2K12 machine that, um, that I have. And what I have done is, Josh spoke about how there are many ways of creating the virtual machine. And in this case, what I have done is, uh, because of the size of the image here, the Win2K12 image is about, I think, nine nine gig or so. <laughs> I directly copied it onto the onto the host. That's where I am, so that I don't have to embed it inside a Docker container and and push it to a registry and then download it again. So I have uh, taken a shortcut, but you don't have to. Uh, this is just for demo purposes. And I'm also mounting that uh, disk. As, as a SATA disk on on that domain. By the way, if you're not familiar with LibWord, LibWord calls all the virtual machine as domain. And uh, this particular section in the specification, uh, there, are, there are lots of knobs that you can use. Uh, really translate it to the XML or the object specification that LibWord is, is, uh, uh, is familiar with. Okay, so with that, I've already created the virtual machine. So let me, do the cube cuttle, cube let's say get version machines. So there is only one version machines because remember there are two types of objects. This is a version machine instance object. So we so let me look at all the version machine instances. So now for the key plane worker one, there is a corresponding instance which is running. If I stop it, if I stop this instance, the virtual machine object will still be there, but running would be false. On the other hand, since I created virtual machine instance for win 2 12 it's already running and I started last night. So hopefully it's still working. The, along with the cube curtail, uh, there, are, there is another utility available called as word CTL that I will be using to show you console access as well as the VNC access to these virtual machines. So let me switch into another tab. And this is my Mac, so let me clear the screen. And what I'm going to be doing is, <clears throat> I'm going to be using, uh, let, let me first make sure that I have all the setup correctly here. So cube config, that gets the VMIs. And I hope to see Vintage 12 and Kplane Worker 1 as the two. Okay, so we have it here. I'm going to use the word CTL command and let me first show you the console access to Kplane Worker 1. And uh, I think it's worth mentioning 
that in an effort to keep with standardizing on this uh, same tooling, right, and the, the, the standardization of the platform, Vert CTL is actually available via a crew plugin. So it plugs in to Cube Control to extend the functionality of Cube Control. So once you have it installed, uh, Vert Control could be executed via Cube Control Vert. Yeah. Uh, since you spoke about that, Josh, um, even the console worked here. I'm going to switch and show that. Okay. So I will go back to my mach another machine. So on one machine, I have I have installed Word CTL. That's what I used here. On another one, I have we installed CTL Word. Uh, let's say console, and let me get out of this one so that we don't have multiple consoles open. So I'm going to do this. Okay. Go back to my machine where the actually let me bring it up top of the okay. So K plane worker worker one and it takes a second. Oops. Okay, here it goes. So the console is connected. We should be able to log in and do what the work we want. But I'm going to get out of here, go back to my Mac because what I really want to show you is the VNC, so that we can look at the Windows desktop. So I'm going to clear this and use my Word CTL to really look at the VNC console. VNC. We need to create bin 12k. Okay, so now it's going to use my chicken VNC. And here we are, the Windows virtual machine is running. So let me send it the control of delete. Oops. And here you are. So the virtual machine is running. I would be able to log into the system after I change my password. I did not change the password. Oops. For people who have used Windows with VNC, you're familiar with this problem of your cursor getting stuck. That's where I am. Come on. Okay. So here you go. Uh, so let me not log in. Uh, I'm having trouble with my mouse. Let me not log in, but as you can see, the Windows virtual machine is running. Let me switch into something different now. So now we are seeing how you can run a Windows virtual machine inside a container. Um, since we are on the topic, let me make sure that I have another. Yeah, okay. So now I have another setup. And so I'm going to show you that this is running on AWS. So I have so I have another setup which is a cluster running on AWS as you can make it out from the node DNS names they're all on EC2 uh, somewhere um, on the US East and I have a few pods running I have a nginx pod and as well as my uh, test virtual machine running on this so let me see if I can show you the test virtual machine. So then YAML. So this is my virtual machine object. It's already running. It is based upon the QWERT Cirrus registry disk demo that's available on Docker. So you can take this example, install QWERT, and you should be able to run this. So I have the virtual machine running. <coughs> uh, as we saw that, and let me make sure it is there. So you will see, yes, there is a test VM running and it has been running for a day. And I have uh, the other parts and I have an Nginx part running. So let me grab the IP address of both of them. Okay, so what I want to do is, and since the Nginx is running a Nginx server, 
I am hoping that going into the work launch of test VM uh, virtual machine, the, 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 that virtual, virtual, virtual machine, I would be able to access that particular IP address to show how the container and virtual machine can, can work together. So, word CTO, oops. Just a second. Word CTO, console, test reader. Okay. Okay, so I'm into the test VM, and you you saw that I was wasn't able to. Uh, it did not give me a prompt to log in, because since it's a console, I logged in last night. I forgot to log out. It's still active. <laughs> okay, so now I can um, I can see if I have NC. So net connect, verbose mode, this IP address and port 80, which is the IP address of the Nginx server. I'm trying to connect on port 80. It's open. And then I should be able to say get slash, HTTP slash 1.1, enter, enter. Okay, Nginx replied back. I did not type in the HTTP commands correctly, but hey, the connection is open. Mm -hmm. The containers and virtual machines are talking. So let me stop there and open it up for questions. All right, so there's, there's lots of questions, uh, just you know, kind of around the premise of the, the architecture of KubeVert. So uh, I'm gonna try and explain it and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong. Let's, let's go about that. Um, so KubeVert exists within Kubernetes. Um, it natively works within Kubernetes uh, it doesn't necessarily reach out to other hypervisors for any kind of um, services or, you know, accessibility. Um, and it, it's networking, security, and orchestration is all container and Kubernetes native functionality. Correct? Okay. Correct. Okay. So there's questions of, like, if I have a case cluster running on ESXi, can Kubevert deploy a VM to ESXi? I'm assuming that's a no. So ESXi, I'm assuming you're running uh, the cluster using virtual machines. Mm -hmm. uh, virtual machines would internally run another virtual machine. So this would be a case very similar to your running virtual machines in AWS. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, with ESX, uh, it's possible, and even with AVM, it's possible to do nested virtualization, so that will work, and the emulation would also work. So the short answer is yes. If you're expecting it to run virtual machines on ESX directly, no, it does not do that. Okay. So just to clarify. <clears throat> so uh, just as an example, because this is sort of kind of like this, I created an OpenStack cloud provider cluster wherein mm -hmm. the cluster was made up of OpenStack VMs. Mm -hmm. um, those OpenStack VMs were actually running on VMware ESX. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. I deployed and created KubeVirt VMs on the OpenStack VMs, which were running on VMware. Yep. So you can go as deep as you want. Mm -hmm. um, it should still work. So many abstraction layers, so little time. Um, yeah. <laughs> the... So the, the premise here is if you're running Kubernetes and you need to run virtual machines as well, you can do both without having to have another project or product to run the hypervisor. Absolutely. You're right. absolutely right, Chris. And that's the motivation. So you have one orchestrator, mm -hmm. um, one set of integrations, mm -hmm. you control both of them together. And a lot of us um, are transitioning applications, existing ones, new ones. They, they need to work together, and it's better to have one platform. Correct. So um, the, there, is, there is a couple questions that I want to just knock out here very quickly. Uh, how do you address security concerns, containers communicating with NVMs on the same pod, isolation, multi-tenancy? That's all handled by Kubernetes, correct? 
Yes, so if you're using CNIs with network policies, uh, Calico, Canal, Weave, um, and others, you can use them as if they are containers or they are just pods. So that's one level of isolation. Running virtual machines, they are actual virtual machines. So you get the virtual machine isolation as well. So mm -hmm. in some ways, it's actually so with that, the virtual machine is isolated within the pod itself, correct? Um, so virtual machine, yes, it's a, it's a regular virtual machine, and it's in the namespace of the pod. Got it. Okay. Um, okay, so that answers that. Do you support any other uh, orchestration platforms like Swarm, Rancher, Cattle, Mesosphere, or anything like that? Um, no, this is very specific to, mm. to Kubernetes. Uh, yeah, that's um, what I suspected. Yeah, and I do not know of anything else mm. uh, similar on other platforms. So a question about performance, really. How does the VM uh, inside the pod launch compared to like a standard you know, pod launch time? What are we talking about? Minutes? Is it dependent upon <clears throat> the OS underneath to the, the greater extent? Well, can you talk to that? So it depends. Yeah, go ahead, Josh. Depends. Yeah. Um, so uh, there, it depends a lot on, for example, whether or not you're using an ephemeral disk or an ephemeral mm -hmm. image, right? like a like a container disk, or mm -hmm. if you have an image already present on a PVC that doesn't need to be uploaded or or retrieved. Right, because there's ways of booting a VM where you've you've specified the source image via an HTTP URL. So of course it's going to automatically down pull that image and put it in a format such that the VM could boot. In that case, we're talking about the uh, process around the actual VM boot. If you mean the mm -hmm. VM itself booting, it, it, it's pretty much instant. Uh, as soon as you get, the, well, instant in the case of if you start the VMI and you mm -hmm. log into its console, you can watch everything run. And assuming you don't have a cloud in it that takes a very long time to run, you should be up and running in 10 or 15 seconds. So, wow. yeah. Okay. So, so uh, l l let me elaborate on that. So, you are, you're running a virtual machine. So, running virtual machine, the OS boot takes whatever time it takes. And you really mm -hmm. don't have control over it. it. depends upon the operating system, the modern operating systems. Right. Especially the, the, the cloud versions are, are pretty thin, slim. They boot up very fast. Yeah. Um, the actual processes are just like any other container or pod. So Libbird right. and Lorbert Launcher, uh, they are exactly like any other pod or container that you're running. So really you're talking about the time it takes to boot the virtual machine itself. So that's one. And B, there's a little bit of time, like what Josh was trying to explain, the amount of time it takes to extract the image. The virtual machine images are going to be bigger. The Ubuntu machines that, that we played with, they're at least 300, 400 MB, uh, which is on the smaller side. The Windows machine that I got, the QCOW2 image was about six gigs. Uh, when you extract it, it's probably nine gigs. So there is some time spent on just dealing with that. So, uh, but assuming that, uh, your images are primed, as in they are they are on all your nodes. Then that time goes away. Then it's just the virtual machine booting time. Cool. So, is there a more user friendly interface uh, outside of the CLI? I mean, we have uh, you know, quite a few tools there, but is there any kind of dashboarding that you know of that's been created around Kubevert? Yeah. There is a web UI project uh, that I wasn't able to show, but you should be able to use it, mm -hmm. which is uh, a graphical interface and provides a lot of validation on top of what I just showed today. Can you say the name again? Sorry. Say that again? Say the name of the tool again. It's called the web UI, I think. Yeah, it's just if you go to the, the Kubevert organization, um, okay. it's an operator that they've uh, created that just deploys the web UI. Cool. All right. Um, lots of people asking for examples of YAML. Um, literally the whole process of going from like nothing to I have a disk to I have a Kubert, you know, running kind of deal. Um, uh, 
Um, do you have a repo that you could possibly share uh, that we could share out with everybody here? Um, I can, I have a, a detailed set of instructions that I've used sort of to, 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 to gather, you know, together some blessed YAML, uh, mm. meaning apply this, apply this, apply this, and you, you should run. There's also a, uh, I, I can put that in a repo for people to look at. Uh, there mm -hmm. is a kubevert demo repo okay. that was made. Um, the, I wasn't actually, the, they, they suggested using Minikube for that, and I personally wasn't able to get things to run correctly uh, with that. It's not terribly old, so maybe, maybe it was just something with my cluster, um, or, or me using Minikube, I'm unsure. Let's so, see. Um, so, so Chris um, and others, the Cuba documentation I thought was really good, to be honest. Okay. Yeah. Um, once we had the Kubernetes cluster running, um, and and it and it's been a while we have been doing this, but I remember once we had the cluster running, uh, it was very easy to set up. The operators are really just a couple of YAML files that you need to mm -hmm. put in. So That's then very nice. they, they started well. They start well. Uh, I spoke about the docs. So if you're going to GitHub, Kubeword, Kubeword. Uh, there is a doc directory, um, extremely well written uh, documentation, very crisp. Uh, there is an examples directory that I highly recommend everyone to look at. It has tons of examples. I hope uh, I wish to add some readmes to it, or we uh, we will contribute some documentation to make it easier for to consume. But it's actually very straightforward. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a, right now, uh, especially when it comes to uh, if you're not using the container disk or one of the container disks. Um, first of all, if you have a container disk that needs to be a different OS, because a lot of the examples use Fedora or Cirrus and you know, things like that. But let's say you really need like CentOS or Ubuntu mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. else, a Windows image, right? Uh, you'd either you know, you really need to use the the CDI um, to, in order to upload that image. Uh, it's just really difficult otherwise, which is kind of the whole reason they made it. But uh, you need to be careful. This is one of these gotchas, right, when, when going through. So the documentation is good. However, um, when it comes to figuring out what version of the CDI works with what version of the kubevert operator, uh, that can be challenging, and, and I definitely ran into some, ran into some issues there, uh, compatibility-wise. But once I found out some versions that worked well together, um, I was off to the races. Yeah. So on on the screen, I'm showing a quick example of uh, how you can create a <clears throat> Docker image out of a virtual machine image, and as you can see, it's actually very very straightforward. Yeah, this is what Rupak did to right. to, to create a. So it, this is a Fedora example, but it can be any QCode image. Um, so you, you, you put that under the, the disk directory inside the image and just create the image and mm. then reference that as the container disk. And that's what's happening here. Interesting. And it's really as simple as that. Wow. Okay. I, this is fascinating, right? Like this is my just blowing my mind right now because I have like, you know, this old tool that I want to keep using and it's a VM and it's just sitting out somewhere and now I can just say, oh, yep. into the cluster you go. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, this it's is exciting. exciting. This is exciting stuff. All right, so um, let's see. Um, so, okay, this is a good question. Licensing, right? Like some of these OSs you mentioned here have licenses like RHEL, Windows. How How is that managed? Like where do you see that happening right now? Yeah, so uh, that is a problem. In fact, uh, so Linux is a lot easier. We were mm -hmm. able to play with it very easily, but Windows, it took us time. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we, we come from virtualization background. Uh, Windows, uh, what they have done is there are uh, evaluation images available that you can use. And subsequently, you will have to purchase licenses. But if you are mm -hmm. just looking to expand, um, we can add the links to the PDF that we are going to share uh, from which you can download the image, and then you can start using it. So yes, it's difficult, but it's not as difficult as, as it used to be. 
Um, so the you know, two counter images available, you should be able to create a very similar Docker file. Just make sure that you purchase licenses afterwards. So it, it doesn't let you run for a really long time. And it will okay. keep nagging you that it's not activated. Right. Okay. Makes sense. Um, yeah, it's more licensing questions here. Uh, how how would you patch the VMs in this case? All right, like you would connect to them via you know, your normal communication methods, correct? Like you define all that in the networking spec, and off you go. <clears throat> yeah. So virtual machines are like machines, so you should be able to, especially if you're using persistent uh, virtual machine, persistent disk with virtual machine, where your OS is on a disk which will survive the reboots, it's on a persistent volume, you can patch as if it's a regular physical machine. So that's one, what I would recommend if you can do it, is really use immutable uh, boot disk, mm -hmm. uh, which can be your container disk, so that, um, so that you can throw them away. Uh, there's a new version of uh, Red Hat uh, mm -hmm. patch available. So instead of using the old one, you just have a new one and just replace it and keep the data on a different PVC or a, or a different volume and then use them together. So, so that's what I would suggest. But you have choices. Yeah, and, and also because kubevert is, is able to leverage Kubernetes native concepts, you're able to create things like a virtual machine instance replica set, for example. So now if you wanted to update, you know, uh, before the, like the hot patching, if you just wanted to update, say, the image that all your VMs are running, you know, you have five of them. You, as a Kubernetes operator, apply that to the deployment or replica set and let the rolling upgrades take care of it. Yep. Nice. <laughs> All right. So it is the top of the hour. I want to respect everybody's time here. So thank you so much uh, for the wonderful presentation. Um, thanks, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. We really appreciate your help today and providing us with this information. Uh, the webinar recording and slides will be online later. Uh, go to, it was shared in the chat. I will repeat it as soon as I find it. I am just filling dead air. CNCF.io slash webinars. Um, go there uh, sometime in the near future. Uh, this webinar will be available. And uh, look forward to seeing you all at the next CNCF webinar. Talk soon. Thanks. Thank you.